Good morning. Uh, this morning I'd like to talk a little bit about baptism, but the actual title to the lesson is Because We Were Baptized. The scriptures plainly teach uh, in baptism that the penitent believer receives remission of sins or forgiveness of his sins. Over in Acts 2 and 38 it says, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, for the forgiveness of sins. In baptism, the penitent believer finds a new life in Christ. Uh, we leave that old life uh, once we've been baptized we into the new life. Romans 6 and verse 4 says we shall walk in newness of life. So our life will change. It must change. Galatians 3 and 27 says for as many uh, of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So baptism is essential unto salvation. Uh, it stands between a death to sin and a new life in Christ Jesus. Uh, baptism must have an essential relationship to the behavior of the Christian, meaning that we must change our life. The inspired writers of the New Testament talk, taught Christians to be faithful, faithful to the duty because they had been baptized. Uh, it's a confirmation of your baptism, your forgiveness of sin, that you start this new life, that you're faithful to God in living that new life. Uh, you know, we studied... Uh, ongoing all the time about why the miraculous uh, things were done during the early church days. It was because it was to confirm the word. Well, our life in God, our faithful life in God after our ba baptism is sort of that way. It's not miraculous, but it's to confirm that we have indeed been forgiven our sins and we're uh, starting this new life, living this new life, and we are the Christian that God would have us to be. And I want to look at, at a couple of things today that Christians should do because we've been baptized. Uh, number one is that every Christian should walk in that newness of life uh, because you have been baptized. You've been uh, cleansed by the blood of Christ. Your sins have been washed away. You don't want to go back and walk and get dirty again. You want to walk in that newness of life. So because you've been baptized, you want to try to remain spotless uh, and walk in that new uh, newness of life. A new relationship with Christ begins at the time of your baptism. That's when all of your sins are washed away. Uh, you'll never be cleaner in the eyes of God than at the time you come out of those waters of baptism when you're white and you're clean. Uh, why this new relationship? Well, over in uh, Romans 6, verse 3 and 4, it says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized unto Jesus Christ were baptized unto His death. Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. We're to continue in this newness of life uh, because we are buried with Christ, we're risen with Christ. Uh, Christians should be servants of righteousness, walk in this newness of life because we've been baptized. Uh, Ephesians 4, we're told to put off the former uh, old man that is corrupt and be renewed and put on this new man. There must be a change in a person's life at the point when they're baptized. Now I'm not saying that you're going to be uh, and know everything you need to know because you're certainly not about the Christian life and how to live at the point of baptism. But that's the beginning part of this new life. Colossians 1 and 13 says, We have been delivered from the power of darkness unto the kingdom of Christ. So at that point that you're baptized and you're washed clean, that is the very beginning of this new life. And you're to strive in this new life day by day to remain faithful to God. So if we keep on living that same old life that we've always lived after we've been baptized, then our baptism and the cleansing of those sins have been to, to no avail. It's not done anything for us if we're just going to go right back to what the life and what we've been doing prior. You know, I, I believe for many, many years the church has come under attack over baptism. Because we preach and we teach that uh, long and loud uh, that 
Baptism is essential to salvation. And I wholeheartedly believe that. I know that God's Word tells me that. And we teach it and we've taught it long and loud. But today, I think the attack and the disagreement with the church has come under a different angle. And, and it's not so much about baptism being required as it is about the people that have been baptized and the life that those people live, the examples that they show. It's, the attack is upon the lives of, of, of those that are, are, are living that are examples after they've been baptized. What good would it do me to be baptized and to proclaim I'm a Christian if I do not stand up and live that new life as a Christian should? You know, we've heard that old adage that our lives may be the only Bible that some people read, our example. And so when people look at us and look at our example, if we don't live that new life, if we don't live that example that God would have us to live, even though we've been baptized, does it show anything to someone that maybe is looking or are searching uh, for something, I don't think it does. Without preaching that baptism must be followed, baptism must be followed uh, by an upright and godly uh, life and a devoted Christian life. Uh, we're not going to be doing what God would have us to do. We must change our life. We must live that life, and living that life as an example and proof is how our life has changed. That is the, what people will look at. That's what people will, will see. If you run into somebody and you've become a Christian since you've last seen them, maybe it's been several years, sometimes people say, whew, I can't believe that. I can't believe that you've become a Christian. I can't believe the life that you're living. That's something that's good. Don't take that as ridicule. That's great. That's good that people notice that your life is different. I think another thing that we should have after we've been baptized is, is unity. Uh, Immediately after Paul declared to the Galatian Christians, uh, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, he said something else. He said in the very next verse, for ye are all one in Christ. That means we're unified together. We're part of God's family. The unity that is talked about here. When a penitent believer is baptized, he's added to the church. You know, when someone walks down this aisle and they're remorseful and they've done the commands that God wants them to do and they follow it up with baptism, I, didn't, I don't add them to the church. I don't say, well, you're now a member of the church. God has added them to His church. Uh, there are many members of the body of Christ. Uh, we make up all the different congregations, all the different members. We make up that one body of Christ. Ephesians 4 and 4 says, There is one body and one spirit. Romans 12 and 5 says, We being many are one body in Christ. So that unity we're supposed to have, we're supposed to work at, and we're supposed to develop as one together in the body of Christ. Why? Because we've been baptized into Christ. Uh, we, we share uh, His teachings. We share His testament. We share His way of living. Uh, whenever strife, whenever dissension enter into any congregation and those involved have uh, forgotten sometimes that they were baptized. I think if, if people would remember every day that they were baptized, that they are Christians, and the life that they're supposed to live, and to be unified together as one, there would be less strife, less dissension. Uh, another thing that we're supposed to, to do after being baptized is that we are to worship God. You know, when 3,000 were, were baptized into the church on Pentecost, Luke reports that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. They weren't baptized. They didn't just go their separate ways and go back to their old life and do whatever. They continued steadfastly in the doctrine and the fellowship of, of the teachings of Christ. This was only natural for Christian worship and, and for those that had been baptized. It has to have a change of life. Worship is not acceptable unto the Lord uh, from those folks that are not Christians. You know, you see 
folks all around the world that think that they can worship God any way that they choose. God is very specific on how He wants to be worshipped. And I think we have to follow uh, His commands for our worship to be acceptable to Him. Uh, Matthew 7 and 21 says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. So there are a lot of people in the world today that practice their worship, but maybe it's not acceptable to God because he says in that day, not everyone that has called on the name of the Lord will enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's all very simple when you stop and think about it. A person who has not believed in the Lord, who, who's not repented of his sins and has not been baptized into Christ, has not begun to do the work of God, to be in the family of God. It's only those who have been born again. John 3 and 3 says, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Um, being born again means that we are born of water and of spirit. Matthew 3 and 5 says, Except a man be born of water and spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So an unbaptized person has not the right to say, My Father who art in heaven. You know, I see a lot of people, and I turn TV channels many times watching shows on TV, uh, preachers, evangelists, and uh, the things that they teach do not align with what the Bible teaches. And yet, they're so pretentious in saying, Oh, my Holy Father and, and a Father in Heaven. And I, I think, boy, I would certainly shiver and shudder to think, if I knew the difference, I sure wouldn't want to, to be that pretentious in, in saying that God is my Father when He wasn't and, and making statements of that nature. God doesn't have children outside His family. Uh, if we look over uh, at Luke 22, uh, 29 and 30, it says, And I appoint unto you a kingdom, as my Father has appointed unto me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on the thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So the Lord's table are in His kingdom. Uh, it's a part of the kingdom, a part of the church for those who've been born again, for those that have been baptized, have become Christians, are living that faithful Christian life. So those who have, have been baptized into Christ for the remission of sins may sit and eat at the Lord's table. In other words, we will be in heaven with the Lord. We will receive that eternity with Him. So how can a, a baptized person a born-again Christian afford to neglect his worship with God. Wouldn't it be a terrible thing for a saved person, a set-apart person, a, a baptized person to neglect such an important thing as to worship God in a wrong manner and in a wrong way? Yet many people do it. And many people feel that they only have to attend services once in a while. I can get all I need just once in a while. Uh, Hebrews 10.25 says, Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much more as you see the day approaching. Do you see the need for uh, living that Christian life, for being unified together, for worshiping God in the way that He wants to be worshipped, for assembling together uh, as Christians we should have regular studies. That's why we have Bible studies on Sunday morning before our service. That's why we have Bible services studies on Wednesday afternoon. As Christians, we are to exhort one another, to teach one another. You know, we're commanded to teach. Uh, Matthew 28, 19, and 22 says, Go, teach all nations, spreading the Word of God. We're commanded to teach one another. How can we go teach if we don't know ourselves? We must know and learn ourselves to be able to fulfill that great commandment. Uh, after baptism, uh, we've not learned all there is about God. I said earlier, sometimes when someone walks down the aisle, we think, okay, they've got it made. They've become a Christian, but they are still a babe. They've yet to learn the life that they should live. It's a growing process. It's an ongoing process. Uh, we've not accomplished all there is to accomplish in our service to God. I've not talked to anyone that says they've accomplished everything that they need to accomplish or want to accomplish for the kingdom of God. 
I've talked to many preachers that have spent a lifetime preaching and they said, we're not through learning yet. We're not through doing and, and carrying out the will of God. There's so much we need to do. There's so many souls yet that need to be saved, that need to hear the word of God. We've not accomplished all there is to, to be accomplished. So the life that we live um, must accompany us so that work can be done. You know, after we are baptized, we are born again. Uh, we, we say we're born again Christians because we're born into a new life into a new way. Galatians 3 and 27 says, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. 2 Corinthians 15 or 5 and 17 says, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. We can't be in Christ and not be a new creature. We can't be in Christ and live that old life. We can't be in Christ and have not have been baptized and had our sins washed away. As newborn babes, we are to desire that milk. And the, the scripture says the sincere milk uh, of the word that we may grow. There's a difference in just hungering for something or really hungering for it. It says sincere milk. You must be sincere about this new life that, you're, uh, that you've entered into. Paul offers a reason why we have so many babes in Christ, if you will. Over in Hebrews 5 and verse 12, it says, For when the time... Uh, ought to be, you ought to be teachers, you have need once again uh, that we teach you, uh, which be the first principles of oracle of God, and become such as need the milk and not of strong meat. It's that people do not learn and do not set aside time to teach, and they don't take this new life serious. A Christian life is something that we should take serious. If we fail to, to feed our children, what happens? They starve. They get hungry. They're neglected. If we fail to feed ourselves spiritually, what happens? We starve ourselves spiritually. We're hungry. Uh, how much time do we spend each day feeding ourselves or our families? How much time do we spend each day feeding our soul, our spiritual side of us? Uh, how much time do we need to spend each day feeding our spiritual life and our spiritual soul? Uh, Matthew 4 and 4 says, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every mouth that proceedeth out of the, every word that proceedeth out of the mouth uh, of God. Certainly, God's word should be prevalent every day in our life. It should be part of the Christian's everyday life. Not just when you're in need, but every day. You should go to the Word of God and read and study. After Paul baptized disciples in Ephesus, he continued to teach them. Uh, and Acts 9, 19 and verse 8 says, He went into the synagogue and spoke boldly. He didn't think that his job was done just because he had taught them and maybe they had responded. He continued to teach uh, so that they could see the results of this new life that he wanted them to live. Not only did those, did those disciples hear the word, but all of those people that dwelt in that area and went to those synagogues heard uh, him preach the word. Uh, Acts 19 and, and 10 tells us every congregation of the Lord's church should uh, uh, have Bible studies, but uh, it says that we're to teach when we've been baptized. Sometimes we fail and we stop short because we think we've got our ticket punched. We think that just because we're a Christian that we can stop and we can relax and we can sit down when it's the time we really should get up and go to work as a Christian. Our life should change. Uh, it should change drastically. Um, lastly, those who have been baptized should seek those things which are above. You know... Romans 6, verse 3 and 4 says, Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized unto Jesus Christ, were baptized unto his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now if your conscience and your moral turpitude hasn't told you that you need to live that new life. This scripture surely does. Even so, we should also walk in newness of life. Uh, 
Galatians 3 and 1, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things from above. What better things can the Christian divulge himself into on a daily basis in this new life than those things that are above? Jesus loved the church. He gave himself for the church. Um, Ephesians 5 and 25 says, Husbands, love your wife, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Do you know what the church means to God? Do you know what the church means to Jesus? He gave himself for it. He, he suffered cruel humility, pain, agony. He suffered for me when I wasn't even there. He suffered for me because he knew that one day I would be a sinner. He took on the sin of the world. Why did Christ give himself for the church? Well, Paul offers two reasons. Over in Ephesians 5 and 26, it says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That's what he did for me through the act of baptism. He sanctified me in that washing of the water. Uh, and the second reason is given in the next verse, 27. It says that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. When we're baptized as a Christian, we're washed clean and we need to present, our, present ourselves as being unified as part of the Lord's church in the life that we live without spot, without wrinkle, so that it'll be glorious to God. It is a command to all that believeth in order to receive salvation. You know, baptism is taught and not taught in, in so many different areas today of religious belief and teachings but mark 16 and 16 says he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved it could not be any clearer than that scripture uh, notice the scripture says before salvation one must believe before salvation one must be baptized it could not be any clearer galatians 3 27 for as many as have been baptized have put on christ we cannot put on christ without being baptized for as many as have been baptized have put on christ we must be baptized to put him on first corinthians 12 and 13 says for by one spirit we are all baptized into one body whether we be Jew or Gentile, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink unto one spirit. We're baptized into one body. The body is the church, which Christ is the head of. He gave himself for it. Uh, 1 Peter 3 and 21 says, Whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. It's not necessary, right? Well, Whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. That cleansing, that washing away of those sins, it does now save us. Uh, and it goes on to say, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. Well, we can take a bath anytime we want to. We can jump in the water anytime we want to. But the answer of a good conscience toward God. That's what it is then, though. It washes away our sins, so we have the answer of a good conscience towards God. How can you stand in front of God with a good conscience without washing away those sins? You can't. Sin separates us from God. It's only by the remission of sins. Baptism of remission of sins. That's what Acts 2.38 teaches us, doesn't it? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Uh, it's absolutely essential. Don't let anyone fool you. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. It's the doorway in which we pass out of that darkness into the light. There's no other way to put it. You can't be washed clean without being baptized. How can you go from darkness into light without being cleansed and that without being clean? I've heard this phrase many times that as Christians, we just must keep on keeping on and be the Christian that we should be. Why? Because we've been baptized. Because we are Christians. We're the example. We're the teachers. We're the people that are going to uh, teach and preach the word because there's so many souls that have never obeyed the gospel. 
I do so hope that everyone here today is a loyal and faithful Christian. Uh, but if there's one here that hasn't obeyed the gospel, we'd certainly like to give you that opportunity. Uh, the Bible's very clear. We're to hear the Word of God. We're to believe it. We're to be repentful. We're to confess Christ as the Son of God and be baptized for the remission of sins. I hope if you're here, you'd want to consent to what God would have you to do to become a child of God. If you are a child of God and maybe you faltered, maybe you've fallen away, maybe you've just got caught up in life, we'd certainly like to give you an opportunity to come back home. If we can help you in any way today, a song's been selected for us. We're going to use it as an invitation to the Lord. So if you will, let's stand and sing it. And if you have a need, please respond. Days are filled with sorrow and care. Hearts are lonely and drear. Burdens are...